Act three. A reception room cut off from a drawing room by an arch. Chandelier lighted. The Jewish band, the one mentioned at Act Two, is heard playing in another room. It is evening. In the drawing room, the Grand Ronde is being danced. The voice of Simeonov Pishkin, dancers come into the reception room. The first pair are Pishkin and Charlotte Ivanova. The second, Trofimov and Lubov Yadreyevna. The third, Anya and the post office clerk. The fourth, Varya and the station master, and so on. Varya is crying gently and wipes away her tears as she dances. Dunyasha is in the last pair. They go off into the drawing room. Pishkin shouting, Grand Ron balances, and Les Cavaliers a genou et remercies von Damme. Chris, in a dress coat, carries a tray with seltzer water across. Enter Pishkin and Trofimov from the drawing room. I'm full-blooded and have already had two strokes. It's hard for me to dance, but as they say, if you're in Rome, you must do as Rome does. I've got the strength of a horse. My dead father, who liked a joke, peace to his bones, used to say, talking of our ancestors, that the ancient stock of the Simeonev Pishkins was descended from that identical horse that Caligula made a senator. But the trouble is, I've no money. A hungry dog only believes in meat. <laughs> so I only believe in money. Yes, there is something equine about your figure. Well, a horse is a fine animal. You can sell a horse. Billiard playing can be heard in the next room. Varia appears under the arch. Madame Lopakin, Madame Lopakin. Decayed gentleman. Yes, I am a decayed gentleman and I'm proud of it. We've hired the musicians, but how are they to be paid? She exits. If the energy which you, in the course of your life, have spent in looking for money to pay interest had been used for something else, then I believe, after all, you'd be able to turn everything upside down. Nietzsche, a philosopher, a very great and most celebrated man, a man of enormous brain, says in his books that you can forge banknotes. And have you read Nietzsche? Well, Dushenka Desh told me. Now, I mean... In such a position, I wouldn't mind forging them. I've got to pay 310 rubles the day after tomorrow. I've got 130 already. Feels his pockets nervously. I've lost the money. The money's gone. Where's the money? Oh, <laughs> here it is behind the lining. I even began to perspire. And to Lubov Andreevna and Charlotte Ivanova. <clears throat> Why is Leonard, Leonid away so long? What is he doing in town? Dunyashka, give me the musician some, some tea. Business is off, I suppose. And the musicians needn't have come, and we needn't have got up this ball. Well, never mind. Charlotte gives a pack of cards to Pishkin. Here's a pack of cards. Think of any one card you like. I've thought of one. Now shuffle. All right, now. Oh, give them here. Oh, my dear Mr. Pishin. Ein, zwe, dre. Now, look, and you'll find it in your coattail pocket. Eight of spades. <gasps> Quite right. Think Charlotte of that. Hold, Charlotte holds the pack of cards on the palm of her hand. It's rough enough. Now, tell me quickly. What's the top card? Well, uh, the Queen of Spades. <laughs> right. Well, now, what's on top? Ace of Hearts. Right. <laughs> How lovely the weather is today. A mysterious woman's voice answers her as if from under the floor. Oh, yes. Um... Madam. <laughs> You are so beautiful. You are my ideal. Voice. You don't please me very much, too. The station master applauds. <laughs> Madam Petrinicist, bravo. Oh, think of that now. Delightful. Charlotte Ivanova, I'm simply in love. In love? Can you love? 
Guter Mensch, aber Schleffer muss ihn kannt. Rafimov slaps Pishkin on the shoulder. Oh, you horse. Attention, please. Here's another trick. Takes a shawl from a chair. Here's a very nice plaid shawl. I'm going to sell it. Won't anybody buy it? <gasps> Think of that now. Ein, zwei, dre. She quickly lifts up the shawl, which is hanging down. Anya is standing behind it. She bows and runs to her mother, hugs her, and runs back to the drawing room amid general applause. Oh, bravo, bravo! Once again, ein, zwei, dre. Lifts the shawl. Varia stands behind it and bows. Think of that now! The end. Throws the shawl at Pishin, curtsies and runs into the drawing room. Little wretch, what would you? Pishin runs after her and exits. Oh, oh. Leonid hasn't come yet. I don't understand what he's doing so long in town. Everything must be over by now. The estate must be sold, or if the sale has never came off, then why does he stay so long? Uncle has bought it. I, I'm certain of it. Oh, yes. Grandmother sent him her authority for him to buy it in her name and transfer the debt to her. She's doing it for Anya. And I'm certain that God will help us and Uncle will buy it. Grandmother sent 15,000 rubles from Yaroslav to buy the property in her name. She won't trust us. And that wasn't even enough to pay for the interest. <sighs> my fate will be settled today. My fate. Madame Lopaki. Eternal student. He's already been expelled twice from the university. Uh, why are you getting angry, Varia? He's teasing you about Lopatin. Well, what of it? You can marry Lopatin if you want to. He's a good, interesting man. You didn't if you want to. Nobody wants to force you against your will, my darling. I do look at the matter seriously, little mother, to be quite frank. He's a good man and I like him. Then marry him. I don't understand what you're waiting for. I can't propose to him myself, little mother. People have been talking about him to me for two years now, but he either says nothing or jokes about it. I understand. He's getting rich. He's busy. He can't bother about me. If I had some money, even a little, even only a hundred rubles, I'd throw up everything and go away. I'd go into a convent. How nice. A student ought to have sense. How ugly you are now, Peter. How old you've grown. But I can't go on without working, little mother. I want to be doing something every minute. Enter Yasha. He's not going to be a cute. And exits. What? Why is a Picadov here? Who said he could play billiards? I don't understand these people. Varia exits. Oh, don't tease her, Peter. You see that she's quite unhappy without that. She takes too much on herself. She keeps on interfering in other people's business. The whole summer she's given no peace to me or to Anya. She's afraid to all have a romance all to ourselves. And what has it to do with her? As if I'd ever given her grounds to believe I'd stoop to such vulgarity. We are above love. Then I suppose I must be beneath love. Why isn't Leonid here? If only I knew whether the estate is sold or not. The disaster seems to me so improbable that I don't know what to think. I'm all at sea. I may scream or do something silly. Save me, Peter. Say something. Say something. Isn't it all the same whether the estate is sold today or isn't? It's been all up with it for a long time. There's no turning back. The path's grown over. Be calm, dear. You shouldn't deceive yourself. For once in your life, at any rate, you must look the truth straight in the face. What truth? You see where truth is and where untruth is. But I seem to have lost my sight and see nothing. 
you boldly settle upon important you boldly settle all important questions but tell me dear isn't it because you're young because you haven't had time to stutter suffer till you've settled a single one of your questions you boldly look forward isn't it because you cannot foresee or expect anything terrible because so far life has been hidden from your young eyes you are bolder more honest deeper than we are but think only be just a little magnanimous and have mercy on me I was born here. My father and mother lived here. My grandfather too. I love this house. I couldn't understand my life without that cherry orchard. And if it really must be sold, sell me with it. Embraces Trofimov, kisses his forehead. My son was drowned here. Have pity on me, good kind man. You know I sympathise with all my soul. Yes, but it ought to be said differently. Differently. Takes another handkerchief. A telegram falls on the floor. I'm so sick at heart today. You can't imagine. Here it's so noisy. My soul shakes at every sound. I shake all over and I can't go away by myself. I'm afraid of the silence. Don't judge me harshly. Peter, I loved you, as if you belonged to my family. I'd gladly let Anya marry you. I swear it. Only, dear, you ought to work. Finish your studies. You don't do anything. Only fate throws you about from place to place. It's so odd. Isn't it true? Yes? And you ought to do something to your beard to make it grow better. <laughs> oh, you are funny. Trafima picks up the telegram. I don't want to be a Beau Brummel. This telegram's from Paris. I get one every day. Yesterday and today. That wild man is ill again. He's bad again. He begs for forgiveness and implores me to come. And I really ought to go to Paris to be near him. You look so severe, Peter. But what can I do, my dear? What can I do? He's ill. He's alone and happy. And who's to look after him? Who's to keep him away from his errors? To give him his medicine punctually? And... Why should I conceal it and say nothing about it? I love him. That's plain. I love him. I love him. That love is a stone around my neck. I'm going with it to the bottom. But I love that stone and I can't live without it. She squeezes Trofimov's hand. Don't think badly of me, Peter. Don't say anything to me. Don't say. For God's sake, forgive my speaking candidly, but that man has robbed you. No, 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 you oughtn't to say that. But he's a wretch. You alone don't know it. He's, he's a petty thief, a nobody. You're 26 or 27 and still a schoolboy of the second class. Why not? You ought to be a man at your age. You ought to be able to understand those who love. And you ought to be in love yourself. You must fall in love. Yes, yes, you aren't pure. You're just a freak, a queer fellow, a funny growth. What is she saying? I'm above love. You're not above love. You're just what our fears calls a bungler. Not to have a mistress at your age. This is awful. What is she saying? Goes quickly into the drawing room, clutching his head. It's awful. I, I can't stand it. I'll go away. Exits, but returns at once. All is over between us. Trofimov exits. No, Peter! Wait! S silly man, I was joking! Peter! Somebody is heard going out and falling downstairs noisily. 
Anya and Varya scream. Laughter is heard immediately. <laughs> What's that? Anya comes running in, laughing. <laughs> Peter's fallen downstairs. And runs out again. This Peter's a marvel. The station master stands in the middle of the drawing room and recites The Magdalene by Tolstoy. He is listened to, but he has only delivered a few lines when a waltz is heard from the front room and the recitation is stopped. Everybody dances. Trofimov, Anya, Varya and Lubov Andreevna come in from the front room. Well, Peter, you poor so pure soul, I beg your pardon. Let's dance. She dances with Peter. Anya and Varya dance. Fears enters and stands his stick by a side door. Yasha has also come in and looks on at the dance. Well, Grandfather? Oh, I'm not well. At our ball, some time back, generals and barons and admirals used to dance. And now we send for post office clerks and the station master, and even they come as a favour. Oh, I'm very weak. The dead master, the grandfather, he used to get everybody ceiling wax when anything was wrong. And I'd taken ceiling wax every day for 20 years and more. Perhaps that's why I'm still alive. I'm tired of you, grandfather. <sighs> if only you'd hurry up and kick the bucket. Oh, you bungler. Trofimov and Lubov and Ryavna dance in the reception room, then into the sitting room. Uh, mercy, I'll sit down. Uh, I'm tired. Enter Anya. Somebody in the kitchen was just saying just now that the cherry orchard was sold today. Uh, sold to whom? He didn't say to whom. He's gone now. Anya dances out into the reception room with Trofimov. Some old man was chattering about it a long time ago. A stranger. And Leonid Andreevich isn't here yet. He hasn't come. He's wearing a light Demi Saison overcoat. He'll catch cold. Oh, these young fellows. I'll die of this. Go and find out, Yasha, to whom it's sold. Oh, but he's been gone along the old man. <laughs> Why do you laugh? What are you glad about? Because of two money. He's a silly man. Two and twenty troubles. Fears, if the estate is sold, where will you go? Well, I'll go wherever you order me to go. Well, why do you look like that? Are you ill? I think you ought to go to bed. Yes, I'll go to bed. And all hand things round and give orders without me. Of the old house on my shoulders. Lubov Andrevana, I want to ask a favour of you, if you'll be so kind. If you go to Paris again, then please take me with you. It's absolutely impossible for me to stop here. What's the good of talking about it? You see for yourself that this is an uneducated country with an immoral population. It's so dull! Food in the kitchen is beastly, and here's this fears walking about mumbling inappropriate various things. Take me with you, please be so kind. Enter Pishkin. I come to ask for the pleasure of a little waltz, dear lady. Dubov Andreevna goes to him. But all the same, you wonderful waltz. I must have 180 little rubles from you. I must. They dance. 180 little rubles. They go through into the drawing room. Oh, will you understand my soul's deep restlessness? In the drawing room, a figure in a grey top hat and in baggy check trousers is waving its hands and jumping about. There are cries of, Bravo, Charlotte Ivanova. Even the mistress tells me to dance. There are lots of gentlemen, but few ladies. And my head goes round when I dance, and my heart beats. Fear, fears, Mikhailovich. The post office clerk told me something just now, which made me catch my breath. 
What did he see, see you? He says, you're like a little flower. Oh, impolite. Yeah, like a little it. flower. I'm such a delicate girl. I simply love words of tenderness. Oh, you'll lose your head. Enter Epicodus. You, Abductor Fedorovna, want to see no me no more than if I was some insect. Oh, life. What do you want? Undoubtedly. Perhaps you may be right. But certainly, if you regard the matter from the aspect, then you, if I may say so, you must excuse my candidness, have absolutely reduced me to a state of mind. I know my fate. Every day something unfortunate happens to me, and I've grown used to it in a long time ago. I even look at my fate with a smile. You gave me your word, and though I... Please, we'll talk later on, but leave me alone now. I'm meditating now. She plays with her fan. Every day something unfortunate happens to me, and I, if I may so express myself, only smile and even laugh. Varia enters from the drawing room. Haven't you gone yet, Simeon? You really have no respect for anybody. You go away, Dunyasha. You play billiards and break a cue and walk around the dining room as if you were a visitor. You cannot, if I may say so, call me to order. I'm not calling you to order. I'm only telling you. You just walk about from place to place and never do your work. Goodness only knows why we keep a clock. Whether I work or walk about or eat or play billiards is only a matter to be settled by people of understanding and my elders. You dare to talk to me like that? You dare? You mean that I know nothing? Get out of here, this minute. I must ask you to express yourself more delicately. Get out this minute, get out! He goes to the door and she follows. Two and twenty troubles. I don't want any sign of you here. I don't want to say anything of you. Epikodos has gone out. His voice can be heard outside. I'll make a complaint against you. What? Coming back? Snatches up the stick left by fears by the door. Go. 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 I'll show you. Are you going? Are you going? Well, then, take that. She hits out as Lopakin enters. Much obliged. I'm sorry. Never mind. I thank you for my pleasant reception. It isn't worth any thanks. Walks away, then looks back and asks gently. I didn't hurt you, did I? No, not at all. There'll be an enormous bump, that's all. Voices from the drawing room are heard. Lopakin's returns! Irma Olai Aglexievich! Now we'll see what there is to see and hear what there is to hear. Kisses, Lopakin. You smell of cognac, my dear, my soul. And we're all having a good time. Enter Lubov Andreevna. Is that you, Emily Alexievich? Why were you so long? Where's Leonid? Leonid Andreevich came back with me. He's coming. Oh, well, what? Is it sold? Oh, tell me. The sale ended at up at four o'clock. We missed the train and had to wait till half past nine. Oh, my head's going around a little. <laughs> Enter Gaev. In his right hand, he carries things he's bought. With his left, he wipes away his tears. Leon, what's yeah. happened? Leon, well? Quick, for the love of God! Here, take this. Here are anchovies, herrings from Kerch. I've had no food today. I have had a time. The door from the billiard room is open. The clicking of the balls is heard, and Yasha's voice. Seven, eighteen! Gaia's expression changes. He cries no more. I'm awfully tired. Help me change my clothes, Fears. He goes out through the drawing room. Fears after him. What happened? Come on, tell us. Is the cherry orchard sold? It is sold. <laughs> well, who bought it? I bought it. Lubov Andreevna is overwhelmed. She would fall if she were not standing by an armchair and a table. 
Varya takes her keys off her belt, throws them on the floor into the middle of the room and goes out. I bought it. <laughs> Wait, ladies and gentlemen, please. My, my head's going round. I can't talk. <laughs> when we got to the sale, Derikhanov was there already. Leonid Andreevich had only 15,000 rubles and Derikhanov offered 30,000 on top of the mortgage to begin with. I saw how matters were, so I grabbed hold of him and bid 40. He went up to 45. I offered 55. Uh, that means he went up by fives and I went up by tens. <laughs> well, it came to an end. I bid 90 more than the mortgage and it stayed with me. The cherry orchard is mine now. Mine. <laughs> oh my God. The cherry orchard's mine. Tell me I'm drunk or, or mad or dreaming. Don't laugh at me. If my father and grandfather rose to my graves and looked at the whole affair and saw how their Emily, their beaten and uneducated Emily, who used to run barefoot in the winter, how that very Emily has bought an estate, which is the most beautiful thing in the world. I've bought the estate where my grandfather and my father were slaves, where they weren't even allowed into the kitchen. I'm asleep. It's only a dream, a, an illusion. It's the fruit of imagination wrapped in the fog of the unknown. Picks up the keys, nicely smiling. She threw down the keys. She wanted to show she was no longer mistress here. Jingling the keys. <laughs> well, it's all one. And he hears the band tuning up. Hey, hey, musicians, play! I want to hear you. Come and look at Emily Lopkin laying his axe to the cherry orchards. Come and look at the trees falling. We'll build villas here, and our grandsons and great grandsons will see a new life here. Play on, music! <laughs> the band plays. Lyubov Andreevna sinks into a chair and weeps bitterly. Lopakin continues reproachfully. Why then? Why didn't you take my advice? Oh, my poor dear woman, you can't go back now. Oh, if only the whole thing was done with. If only our uneven, unhappy life were changed. Pishkin takes his arm in an undertone. She's crying. Let's go into the drawing room and leave her by herself. Come on. Takes his arm and leads him out. What's that? Bandsman, play nicely. Go on, do just as I want you to. The new owner, the owner of the cherry orchard is coming. He accidentally <laughs> knocks up against the little table and nearly upsets the candelabra. I can pay for everything. <laughs> Exits with Pishkin. In the reception room and the drawing room, nobody remains except Lubov Andreevna, who sits huddled up and weeping bitterly. The band plays softly. Anya and Trofimov come in quickly. Anya goes up to her mother and goes on her knees in front of her. Trofimov stands at the drawing room entrance. Mother, mother, are you crying? My dear, kind, good mother, my beautiful mother, I love you. Bless you, the cherry orchard is sold. We've got it no longer. It's true, true, but don't cry, mother. You've still got your life before you. You're still your beautiful, pure soul. Come with me. Come, dear. Come away from here. Come. We'll plant a new garden, finer than this, and you'll see it, and you'll understand, and deep joy, gentle joy will sink into your soul like the evening sun, and you'll smile. Mother, come, dear, let's go. Curtain. End of Act Three.